and discuss energy resources and the environmental impacts of those energy resources. I often like to subhead this topic uh, looking at the true cost of fossil fuels. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to break this into two sections. So the first half of this discussion, today's talk, we're going to be looking at the most widely used uh, energy resource which is fossil fuels. The second half of this discussion we're going to be looking at the other two types, nuclear energy and our renewable energy sources. So let's begin and let's talk about the three energy types that we're going to talk about in this class fossil fuels, nuclear, and then our alternative or renewable energy sources. Now fossil fuels are the most widely used about 80 percent of the energy that is consumed in this country comes from coal, oil, and natural gas. However, even though they're the most widely used, we're going to see they have the most serious environmental impacts. Then we're going to talk about nuclear, and once again, we'll talk about that in the second half of this discussion. And then we'll look at our renewable energy sources. And I want to point out that the order of that list is important, guys. I have them listed in the most widely used renewable energy source, which is biomass, to geothermal, which is the fifth most widely used. So I have them listed in decreasing order of use in the U.S. And so that's how we're going to talk about them. We're going to talk about biomass, which is the most widely used, then hydroelectric, which is second, then wind, then solar, and then geothermal. So the order there is important. Now here is our energy budget and once again guys you can see um, petroleum is the most widely used. By the way this is 2018 source so oil is 36 percent. Natural gas which has actually increased dramatically over the last decades about 31 and then coal's about 13 and decreasing every year Thank God, it is the most, uh, it's the dirtiest of the three fossil fuels. Then our um, renewable energy budget, guys, is about 11%. And once again, you can see biomass is about 45%. So almost half of our renewable comes from biomass, and we'll talk about that later. Then hydroelectric at about 23. Then wind at about 22. Solar is about 8, and geothermal is about 2. The other 8% of our energy budget comes from nuclear energy. So these two right here, guys, that 19%, that's going to be the second half of our discussion. This first half, we're going to look at these, our three fossil fuels. And if you look at our energy consum consumption through time, going all the way back once again to Industrial Revolution, guys, well, you can always see that fossil fuels have always made up a fairly large percentage the blue being coal, the red being natural gas, and the green being um, oil. Uh, the purple that you see here, that's hydroelectric, which has actually been fairly important from the beginning. Nuclear is the light blue, and then the orange is then all the other renewable energy sources. So we have always been highly dependent on fossil fuels. Remember guys, 2018 source, 80% of our energy came from coal, oil, and natural gas. And so let's begin there. What are fossil fuels? Fossil fuels are hydrocarbons. Remember we talked about hydrocarbons back in environmental health. A hydrocarbon is a chemical compound that is composed of carbon, hydrogen, and sometimes oxygen in its structure. So what a fossil fuel is, is a hydrocarbon formed when the remains of living organisms were died, they were slowly buried, pressure increased, temperature increased, and slowly that organic material was slowly converted into coal, oil, and natural gas. So all of our fossil fuels originated as organisms, biological organisms. They died and were slowly transformed over hundreds of millions of years into the fossil fuels that we use today. Now, remember guys, we talked about on the first day of this class how we had renewable and non-renewable natural resources. Fossil fuels are non-renewable. 
Once they're gone, they're gone forever. We can't replenish them because it requires hundreds of millions of years to form. Now let's talk about uh, the original organic material that fossil fuels start off at. And so let's start, start with coal, guys. And I want to point out this picture that I've shown you before. This is from the late Paleozoic where we had these massive swamps covering all of Pangaea as it began to come together. Well, all of that plant material, guys, eventually th those plants die, are buried with sediment, pressure increases, and temperature increases, and eventually that plant material is converted into coal. So coal starts off as plants and is slowly converted in the coal over hundreds of millions of years. Remember the late Paleozoic guys, the first two periods in it were called the Carboniferous, and the reason we called it is what's the main ingredient of coal? Well, it's carbon, it's a hydrocarbon. Now, oil comes from the marine environment. So coal comes from a terrestrial or land-based environment. Oil comes from a marine environment, and it starts off as algae. So picture you have uh, a mat of algae on the ocean surface. That algal material dies, sinks to the bottom of the ocean, is covered with sediment, and once again, pressure increases and temperature increases, and slowly that algae is converted into petroleum or into oil. Now, our last fossil fuel is natural gas. And natural gas is what is known as a thermal byproduct. What that means, guys, is as we cook the plant material and as we cook the algal remains, we are going to produce natural gas as a side product of that reaction. So here's the interesting thing, guys. Um, if we usually have a large deposit of coal, we will probably have some natural gas associated with that deposit. Just like if we have a large deposit of oil, we're going to have a, a large deposit of natural gas associated with it. So natural gas is this thermal byproduct of the cooking of both plant and algal remains, and therefore natural gas will be found, usually associated with coal or oil. Now the most abundant, the most widely used natural gas, and by the way, whenever they say, oh, you're cooking with natural gas, or that bus is running on natural gas, usually it's the natural gas called methane. That is by far the most abundant and widely used, which is CH4. And something that we've also discussed, guys, CH4, is that polyatomic? Yes, it is, which means methane is a, yes, that's right, greenhouse gas. Now, before we get into the, the negatives, and we're going to spend a great deal of time talking about the negatives, guys, let's talk about the positives of fossil fuels. Number one is while there are winners and losers in the fossil fuel game, okay, not everybody has it guys, but we have fairly abundant sources worldwide of coal, oil, and natural gas. It's efficient. When we burn fossil fuels, we can get fairly high amounts of energy out of it. Low cost, and there's the key guys. What have I been saying since day one? What does it always come down to? Money, money, money. And so that is the biggest advantage of fossil fuels. When you compare fossil fuels with nuclear or renewable, it's often two to three times cheaper than the other two sources. And remember, guys, that's always our first consideration is cost. Uh, we have existing infrastructure. Think about it, guys. Since the Industrial Revolution, Way back when we started to make electricity, we made a decision that we were going to um, use fossil fuels. And therefore, all of our infrastructure that we have built since then, pipelines, tankers, refi refineries, have all been built around fossil fuels. If we were to switch to, let's say, wind or solar, it would cost us billions of dollars up front to make that switch in infrastructure. So once again, there's, there's 
economics guys playing a large role. And then power plants can be set up anywhere. You can set up a coal-fired power plant anywhere in the middle of nowhere. Okay, Think about it, guys. There are restrictions on where we can build a nuclear power plant or where we can build a solar plant. Okay, Think about it. Let's say we wanted to build a new nuclear power plant and we want to build it and we decided to build it in California right on top of a fault line. Good idea? No way. Okay? Let's say that we wanted to build a solar power plant and we decided to build it in Chicago. Would that be a good idea? No. We need to build it where we have um, a lot of days of sunshine. So there are restrictions on where we can build nuclear power plants, where we can build wind farms, where we can build geothermal power plants. Coal-fired power plant doesn't have that problem. Now, we're going to talk about oil and natural gas first, guys. And here's why I'm breaking it up as I, as I am. Think about it. Oil is a liquid and natural gas is a gas. Once these things are created in the subsurface, they're mobile, guys. They're going to move. And so we're going to talk about them together. And so here's what we start with. We start with something called source rocks. The source rocks are the rocks that have, in this case, the algal remains in them. Those are the rocks that we're going to squeeze with higher pressures and cook with higher temperatures to generate the oil and natural gas. So we start with the source rocks. Barium, pressure goes up temperature goes up and over hundreds of millions of years we're going to generate let's say a, a pocket of oil and a pocket of natural gas now because those things are mobile guys because of their state of matter they will then migrate in the subsurface through something that we call porous reservoir rocks now that word porous means that it has holes in it so the rocks in the subsurface have to have holes in it to allow the liquid and gas to move through it. Okay? So we start with the source rocks. We generate the oil and natural gas. They then move through these reservoir rocks. Now motion will only stop when our oil and natural gas becomes trapped underneath in something called impermeable cap rocks. Now that word impermeable means that liquids and gases cannot move through it. It acts like a barrier. And we need to have those cap rocks, guys. Without the cap rocks, the oil and natural gas will continue to move. They will continue to be mobile. So that's the process. We cook and squeeze the source rocks. The oil and natural gas move through our reservoir rocks and are trapped underneath our impermeable cap rocks. Now, in order for oil and natural gas to become trapped and then become concentrated, we need the right geologic conditions to exist in the subsurface. These conditions are what are called oil and natural gas traps. And there's four of them that we're going to look at an anticline trap, a fault trap, a salt dome trap, and a stratigraphic trap. All these things are, guys, are just the right geologic conditions to trap and concentrate pockets of oil and natural gas in the subsurface. Okay. Now, let's look at the four types of traps and let's start with an anticline trap. If you've ever taken a geology class, guys, I'm sure you've heard of this word before. What an anticline is, it's a series of uh, layers of rocks that have been folded to form an arch-like structure in the subsurface. So we have cap rocks underneath, cap rocks above. So the oil and, and natural gas can't go anywhere, guys. Here's our reservoir rocks, this layer right here. Now, in addition to transmitting oil and natural gas, it also transmits water, okay, often called groundwater that we're going to look at once we get to water resources. Now, the reason you see this layered structure is due to density differences. The water is densest, so it will always be found here on the bottom. 
Oil is an intermediate density. It'll be the middle layer. And the natural gas has the lowest density of the three, and so it will be always found on top. So here's what happens. The oil and natural gas flows in, guys, into this nice natural pocket. Think of it, at, that's exactly what it is, a natural pocket. It flows in, but it doesn't have enough energy to flow out, to flow back down this limb of the anticline. And so once again, it becomes trapped and concentrated so that we discover it, we drill a well, and we extract the oil and natural gas. Our second trap is a fault trap. Now remember, we've already looked at this when we talked about earthquakes, guys. Remember what a fault is. It's when we break the rocks, when we have brittle deformation, and one side moves relative to the other. In this case, here's our fault. This side is moved up, this side is moved down. And so here's our cap rocks, and once again, look what we've done. Created this nice little natural pocket for the oil and natural gas to become trapped in. So it becomes trapped, we discover it, once again we drill a well and extract it. Our third type of trap is a salt dome trap. Now, let me show you how this works, guys. Okay? So let's say that we have a layer of salt somewhere down here in the subsurface. Okay? What happens is that salt is under fairly high pressures and temperatures. It fluidizes, which means it ceases to behave like a solid and acts like a liquid. It then pushes its way up because it has a lower density than the rocks around it. And so as it pushes its way up, as it gets close to the earth, it cools down and solidifies again. And so you get this kind of bulbous mass of salt. That's what call, is called the salt dome. Now, as it pushes its way up, guys, look at what it does here. It's cre it creates these nice little natural pockets, once again, for the oil and natural gas to become trapped in. There are literally thousands of salt domes in the Gulf of Mexico, in Texas, in Oklahoma, which is why those areas uh, tend to have a lot of oil and a lot of natural gas. Our last trap for oil and natural gas is our stratigraphic trap. Now what this is, once again, we have cap rocks above and below here. Here's our reservoir rock. And as, it go, as we go laterally, it gets thinner and thinner and thinner until eventually it peters out, okay, disappears. And so once again, guys, look what we've done. We've created this nice little natural pocket for the oil and natural gas to become trapped under. So, once again, the four traps that we just looked at, our anticline trap, our fault trap, our salt dome trap, and our stratigraphic traps, these are just the right geologic conditions that need to exist if we want to trap and concentrate oil and natural gas in the subsurface. Okay. Now, we don't have this problem with coal, guys, because once coal forms, is it going anywhere? No, it's a solid. So the reason we need these traps is because oil, a liquid, and natural gas, a gas, is mobile in the subsurface. Now, before we go any further, we need to discuss the difference between a resource and a reserve. Okay? The title of this talk was Energy Resources. What a resource is it's everything. Every single ounce of coal on earth are our coal resources. Every drop of oil on earth are our oil resources. They include everything that is known and everything that is yet to be discovered. So known and unknown. Everything that is economical to extract by today's standards and everything that is not yet economical. Now, once again, we have to talk about economics here, guys. Let's say that we own a, a, a drilling company and we're drilling for oil. Do we just, once we discover an oil deposit, do we willy-nilly start drilling? Of course we don't, guys. We have to take into account the size of the oil, what we can sell that oil for, and how much money it's gonna cost us to get the oil out of the ground. Let's say we do that calculation, guys, and we discover that we would lose money by extracting the oil. Are we going to do it? Of course we're not, guys. That's what we mean by economical. 
So there are some deposits we know about today, but it simply isn't economical to get the oil out of the ground because the price of oil is fairly cheap right now. Last time I checked, it was like $55, $50, $55 for a barrel. So at those costs, not worth it. Okay. So resource is everything. What we know about and what we don't know about. What's economical to extract today and what's not yet economical. Now here's the thing, guys. And I always ask my kids the following question. Do we care about oil that we haven't found yet? Or do we care about oil that we're going to lose money getting out of the ground? No, we don't, ladies and gentlemen. So really what we are concerned with are something called reserves. A known quantity of a resource that can be extracted economically by today's standards. So if you look at this diagram over here, guys, think of this big box as all the fossil fuels on Earth. Everything that we know about, everything that we don't know about, everything that's economical and everything that isn't economical. Really, all we care about, guys, is this little sub box um, in the resource box reserves. What we know about and what we can extract economically today. And so from this point forward, guys, we're not going to talk about coal resources or oil resources. We're going to talk about coal reserves and oil reserves, natural gas reserves, because that's all we care about, what we know about and what we can extract economically. And so let's jump in, guys, and let's talk about our global oil reserves. Okay. Now, this is 2018 data. Um, if you look at where the oil is, almost half, 48% was found in the Middle East. We know that, guys. Iraq, Iran, Syria, all fairly uh, uh, cutter, all fairly rich in oil. About 21% in Central and South America. If we look at South America, guys, Venezuela is a major player in the oil game. And then about 12.5% in North America. However, most of that is not the United States, guys. It's actually Canada, which has some fairly large deposits of oil. Now, if you look at this, once again, the same year, 2018 data, the three countries with the greatest oil reserves, Venezuela was number one, Saudi Arabia was number two, and believe it or not, Canada was number three. Those were the three countries with the greatest oil reserves. Now, I wanted to give you some idea. I don't expect you to memorize these numbers, guys, but I wanted to give you some idea of how much oil we use in this country. So that same year, 2018, the United States, we, use about, we used about 20 and a half million barrels of oil a day. A day, ladies and gentlemen. And if you do the math, and I did, guys, that amounted to about seven and a half billion barrels total just for that year, okay? And that, once again, you start adding all the hundreds of countries that use oil, and you can see why oil is really declining is simply of our greatest use. Now, if you're curious, guys, a barrel of oil is equal to 42 gallons, okay? Just to give you some idea of size of this. So think about that, 20 and a half million barrels a day. Think about everything that we use oil for. And I know everybody thinks about gasoline, and yes, gasoline and motor oils, that's a fairly large use, but think of the other major thing that comes from petroleum, guys. Plastics. Think about all the plastics that we use. Uh, a fairly large use of petroleum as well. Now, that same year, guys, I, I, once again, I want to compare apples to apples here. So 2018, we imported not quite half. So we were using about 20 and a half million barrels a day. We were importing about 10 million barrels a day. So about half, not quite half guys, of the oil that we use we have to depend on other countries for and Canada is our leading supplier of oil. We also we do get it from the Middle East. We do get oil from Saudi Arabia. Uh, also we get oil from, from Russia, from Venezuela, even from some African nations. But our biggest thing, think about it from a cost perspective guys, it makes sense 
that Canada supplies us with a lot of oil because costs for transportation are going to be fairly low. Now, here is, this is not quite the 2018 data, but this is 2017 data. You can see, once again, guys, these three biggest countries. Here's Venezuela, if you didn't know, guys. Remember, that was number one. Saudi Arabia, number two. And then Canada, number three, as far as global oil reserves. We're, we're you know, kind of medium right here, guys, as far as the amounts of oil that we have. Uh, let's talk about natural gas. Um, this is 2017 data, but if you look at the, the four biggest countries that had the most natural gas, Russia was number one, Iran was number two. Now, I've heard it pronounced Qatar. I've also heard it pronounced Qatar. I, I think both are correct, guys. Number three, I, I say Qatar, so that's what I'm talking about. And then it's actually a tie between us and Saudi Arabia as far as natural gas. So these are really the big players as far as natural gas goes. Now here's the interesting thing about natural gas. Mostly your global reserves are set. But the actual global reserves of natural gas have been increasing because we've started to use non-conventional or unconventional techniques like fracking. And we'll talk about what fracking is here in a couple minutes. So you can actually see here guys, in 1994 we had about 119 trillion cubic meters of natural gas. Ten years later it was 156. Ten years later it was 187. So because we're fracking more we're able to get natural gas out of formations that we couldn't uh, 20 or 30 or even 40 years ago. So that is why our proven global reserves are increasing is because of fracking. Now let's talk about what hydraulic fracturing or what everybody calls fracking is. Here's what you do guys. You have a layer in the subsurface. We call it a tight layer. So you have a geologic formation that's tight. It has oil and natural gas in it but if you were to simply drill a well into it, you couldn't get the oil and natural gas out. That's what we mean when we say tight. It doesn't want to flow out of that rock. So here's what we do. We actually drill a vertical well. Off of that vertical well, guys, we drill a horizontal well into the layer that we're interested in. We then inject water, sand, and hundreds of chemicals into that geologic formation all for one purpose to fracture it guys okay so we inject these things at high pre at high pressure to create small cracks or fractures in the rocks once that's done we can then use that same horizontal well to pump out the oil and natural gas okay this is what fracking is we break the rock essentially by injecting water, sand, and chemicals at very, very high pressures. Now, here's the problem, guys. The first two are okay, water and sand, but some of the chemicals used in the fracking industry are known carcinogens. They do have environmental health effects, guys. And once they're injected, they can then contaminate groundwater. And that's one of the biggest, most serious consequences of fracking, guys is first off once you break the rock those hydrocarbons yes we want to extract them but they can um, flow into different layers and let's say that we were pumping out water to use as a potable water source now we've just contaminated um, our groundwater they can also um, migrate to the surface where they can volatilize and become air contaminants and so, once again, guys, we talked about this when we were talking about health. Uh, most hydrocarbons are known carcinogens. And so, the more you're exposed to them, and by the way, you live in areas like South Dakota, North Dakota, uh, parts of Ohio, Pennsylvania, where fracking is common, you're going to have higher exposure to those hydrocarbons, which means your risk of certain types of cancers is going to be fairly high. Uh, you'll see on this page, guys, I have a YouTube video 
That's actually a video of um, a, a woman who was living in a fracking area. And if you've ever seen the YouTube videos where they're able to light their water on fire because of all the natural gas, that's what that YouTube video shows. Is she actually lights her water on fire because of all the natural gas that's coming out. And so there is a serious health risk for those individuals living around these fracking industries. Now, once again, here's what we're talking about, guys. So here's that tight formation that has the oil and natural gas. We drill a vertical well first, then off of that vertical well, we drill a horizontal well. We inject the water, the sand, and those chemicals at high pressures, creating these fractures. We can then pump out the oil and natural gas. But a lot of cases, the hydrocarbons may flow because they have a lower density than the rock, they may flow into these layers up here. And notice, let's say that this yellow layer, guys, was where we were getting our potable water from. So now we've just contaminated that source of water. And once again, you drink that water with the high hydrocarbon content, there are serious health effects down the line. All right, now let's talk about some of the environmental impacts. Now, we're not going to discuss burning yet. I want to save that till the very end, guys. So what these are, are environmental impacts from the extraction and transportation of oil and natural gas. Number one, we build artificial structures, roads, pipelines, cities in environmentally sensitive areas, in tundra regions, in forest regions, and we disrupt the natural ecosystem. So just from us building artificial structures, we can have um, consequences for the biological organisms living there. The other big source of problems is contamination, guys. Take a look at the, the top picture on the right shows a pipeline in Alaska that has sprung a leak and you can see that plume of oil uh, spraying out, which is then going to contaminate the trees, the soil, any nearby um, surface water bodies, even it's going to infiltrate down and contaminate groundwater resources. Um, tanker platform spills. Most of you are too young to remember the 1989 Exxon Valdez spill. This is when, swear to God, look this up guys, I'm not lying. This is when a tanker captain, the tanker captain of the Valdez, decided to get strink, stinking drunk on wild turkey. And he thought that after drinking an entire fifth of wild turkey, it would be a good idea to drive his tanker that was loaded with oil. Um, you can probably guess the results, guys. He ran into some rocks off of the southern coast of Alaska and spilled about 11 million gallons. That was by far the worst uh, tanker spill in the history until um, in 2010, most of you guys remember the deep one, uh, the Deepwater Horizon spill by uh, BP. Uh, what happened was um, a release valve that was supposed to release the pressure from drilling. Uh, it was sealed shut, and what happened, the pressure built and built and built until you had an explosion on that rig. And I remember that entire summer, guys, you could actually turn to CNN and watch the oil gushing into the Gulf of Mexico. It took them about three months because of the... Uh, depth of that um, where they were drilling it took them about three months to plug the hole by the time they had finally plugged it they had released about 170 million gallons of oil so that hopefully we won't have anything that tops that but here's the evil genius of what BP did they knew that they were they were looked at as as you know evil corporate stooges and so here's what they decided to do. Let's lower our gas prices um, all across um, the, the, the world. And if you notice, guys, uh, I, you know, I live in the valley. If you notice, what gas station always has the lowest prices in the valley? It's um, Arco, right? Guess what Arco is? A subsidiary of BP. Most of us were mad for about 10 minutes. Oh, you BP, you evil, evil men. Hey, look at that. The prices are pretty good over there. 
And so most of us forgot. Uh, I do not shop at BP simply because they're one of the most heavily fined oil um, companies in the world. They tend not to take safety precaution me uh, measures or proper safety precaution measures. Um, and so that was the result of that spill. Yes, it, it cost them billions of dollars for the cleanup. They also, if you remember that the summer afterwards, they, they had a lot of ads on the TV where the, the governor of Alabama would say, come on back down to Alabama, we're oil free. They paid for all of that as well. But do you really think it slowed them down in the long run? It didn't, guys. All right, let's move on to coal now. And once again, the reason we talked about oil and natural gas together is because, remember, they were mobile in the subsurface. Coal is not. So coal is when we take that plant material and we slowly convert it into something called peat. Peat is this kind of partially decayed plant material. So coal actually goes through a process, guys. Plants to peat over hundreds of millions of years. And if the peat, if we continue to jack up pressure and temperature, will eventually turn into, into coal. So peat is not coal, guys. It's often called the precursor to coal. But it's this kind of intermediate member. So plant to peat to coal. Now, not all coal is the same. We actually have what are called coal ranks based on how much energy we can get out of it. The lowest rank of coal is called lignite. The intermediate rank, we can get more energy out of the intermediate, is bituminous. And the highest energy rank is called anthracite. We'd love to burn anthracite because we'll get the most energy out, but it's fairly rare because it takes incredibly high pressures and temperatures to form. Now, all of the fossil fuels are highly um, polluting, very, very dirty, but coal is the worst of the worst. So coal is dirtier than oil, coal is dirtier than, than um, natural gas. It's so bad, we give it the nickname Mother Nature's Junk Basket. So anything that Mother Nature doesn't want, it puts in the coal. And once we burn that coal, we then release often those toxic substances to the environment. So the fact we should be trying to kill our coal industry, ladies and gentlemen. The good news is coal use has decreased dramatically over, say, the last 10 years, but that needs to go down to zero. Very, very dirty, dirty source. Now, if we look at global coal reserves, once again, 2018 data here, guys, we have the most coal reserves. Woohoo! Okay, not a lot of oil. Uh, we we were fourth on natural gas, but we have fairly large coal deposits. Russia's number two, and China is the other big player as far as the coal game. Now let's look at the coal ranks, but I want to start with peat. But I want to make this absolutely clear, so I'm going to say it twice. Peat is not coal. Peat is not coal, but I still wanted to talk about it. It's once again called the precursor to coal. It's this partially decayed vegetation material. If you look at this top picture here, guys, you notice this kind of dark brown to blackish layer right here? That's peat. That's this undecayed plant material. If we take that peat, we bury it, subject it to more pressure and temperature, then over hundreds of millions of years we can slowly convert it into coal. But it's, but peat is not coal, guys. Precursor to coal. It's this intermediate member. All right, let's start with the first rank of coal, which is lignite. Now, this is going to have the lowest energy content, guys. It's often called immature coal. It has high water content and high ash content. If you look at that picture on the lower right-hand side, Notice when things that have a high organic content, what color are they, guys? Think about topsoil. Topsoil has a high organic content. What color is it? Black. So that is light gray. So what does it mean for its organic material or its organic content? It's low. We do not burn lignite for energy in this country, but some of the poorer African nations do. 
they do use lignite because it's cheaper to buy on the open market. Our second rank of coal is bituminous. That's that top picture there on the right hand side. Um, this is often what we burn for electricity in the US. Remember, most of our electricity comes from coal-fired power plants. That's what we burn because it's fairly abundant and it has a fairly good energy content. Look at its color, guys. It's black. So the organic material, the organic content is fairly hot. Now here's the interesting thing about coal. Remember earlier on in the semester we talked about the three types of rocks, igneous, metamorphic, and sedimentary. Well, believe it or not, depending on the rank, coal can be classified as two of the three types of rocks. Bituminous coal forms through sedimentary processes and is therefore classified as a sedimentary rock. So the type of coal that we burn is a sedimentary rock. Now, our last highest energy rank of coal is anthracite. That's the, the bottom right picture there, guys. Now, this type of coal actually undergoes metamorphism and is therefore classified as a metamorphic rock. Requires very, very high pressures, very, very high temperatures to form. Now, that's going to be fairly rare, guys. We generally don't see um, geologic um, regions or provinces where the pressure and temperature is high enough to form anthracite. So we'd love to burn it, guys. It's going to have the highest energy content, but it's, it's a lot rarer than bituminous, and that's why we settle on bituminous. Um, here are um, the relationship between to uh, coal type and energy content. So on the x-axis here, guys, is the amount of carbon in the coal, so the amount of organic content, think. And on the y-axis is the heating value. This BTU per pound, if you've ever heard of that, guys, BTU stands for British Thermal Unit. It's essentially a measurement of energy. The higher the BTU per pound, the more energy we can get out of it. And so look at this, guys. Here's lignite on the low end. It has maybe 30 to 35% carbon and let's say 7,000 to 8,000 BTU per pound. On the other hand, here's bituminous, way up here, guys. It has over half uh, carbon in uh, the solid, but look at it. You're talking about maybe um, 13,000 to 15,000 BTU, almost double what you see in lignite. There's a big gap, guys, between lignite and bituminous. Now here's anthracite over here. The highest percent carbon, you might be talking about 80% um, carbon in the solid, but you're talking about maybe 15, 16, uh, thousand BTU per pound. So the difference between bituminous and anthracite isn't that great as far as energy content. And once again, that's why we settle on bituminous. It's a lot more abundant and it has fairly good energy content. Now, if you look at, once again, global coal reserves, I know this picture is a little bit dated, guys, but I, but I liked how they visually put this together. Remember the, the three players in the coal game. U.S., number one. Russia, number two. China, number three. Everywhere else, if you're talking about uh, Europe, South America, Africa, fairly low as far as coal reserves go. Here's what uh, the picture looks like in the U.S., the different colors represents the different ranks, guys. Okay, so the green is actually not a rank at all. That's, uh, I'm sorry, the green is the lowest rank. That's lignite. So that's that, that low energy. We don't burn it, but we do mine lignite to sell to other countries on the open market. The blue, orange, and tan are different types of bituminous. So you'll notice this western interior basin that stretches from Oklahoma into Iowa the Illinois Basin and the Appalachian Basin, those are major coal producing states. If you look at states in the US, guys, Illinois, um, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, these are kind of our, even in Kentucky, these are our major coal producing states. You, you'll, you do see some coal in the Rockies, but it's scattered, it's not as continuous, and it's harder to, to um, extract. 
So generally most of our coal production is in the upper Midwest or even in parts of the eastern U.S. These small uh, red blurbs, that's our anthracite guys. Very, very rare to find because it requires such high pressures and temperatures. Now, when it comes to coal, we have two methods to extract it. Surface mining, called strip mining, and underground mining. Now, we do not determine which method we use. Where the coal is located will determine which technique is used. So if the coal is fairly close to the Earth's surface, we'll use a strip mine to get it. Now, here's the good news. Surface mining is all positives. You can recover 90 to 95% of the coal. And remember, the more coal you recover, the more money you're going to make. It's much cheaper to extract the coal, and it's relatively safe. So we would love to use surface mining techniques because it's all positives. The problem is, is let's say that we have a major coal deposit that's a mile and a half below ground surface. Is it going to make economic sense to drill a mile and a half worth of rock? Remove all that rock to get at the coal? No. And so then we would have to use underground techniques. Now, surface mining was all positives. Underground mining is all negatives, guys. You can recover 40 to 50% of the coal. And let me be honest here, guys. It's probably closer to 40. Because you have to leave the other half in place because it's holding up thousands of feet of rock on top of you. So I say 40 to 50%. Recovery is probably closer to 40. You might be lucky if you get 40% out. So the coal deposit has to be large enough where 40% is going to be economical. It's much more expensive, requires um, more um, equipment. You have to drill air shafts. You have to drill elevator shafts. Uh, and underground miners make more because they put their lives on the line every day. So it's much more expensive. And it's extremely dangerous. You always have to worry about collapse and then explosions. Remember we said natural gas was a thermal byproduct. So often in a coal mine, you'll get pockets of natural gas like methane. And there have been times in the, in the past where a spark has caused an explosion which caused a collapse in the mine. Often you'll hear at least a couple times a year, guys, of a West Virginia coal mine. I can remember, I can't remember the year but the Chilean miners, remember, they had a collapse of their mine. Uh, most of them were saved, and then they actually kind of got famous uh, and kind of went on this uh, book signing or, or kind of interview tour. So underground mining, very, very dangerous. But once again, if the coal um, reserve, if the coal um, deposit is large enough, where 40% means we can make money, we'll do it. Now here's our, our surface mining or strip mining techniques. Um, fairly easy, guys. If, if, if the coal is fairly close to the air surface, we remove all of the, the, the rock on top of it. That's called waste, okay? Often called um, um, overburden. That's all the rock or the waste that's on top. So we remove that, we get down to the coal bed, and then we can remove the coal at our leisure. And once again, good recovery, 90 to 95% recovery. You can see over here in this picture, guys, uh, take a look at the sidewall. They've actually removed several very, very thin layers. They're removing the gray rock, which is this overburden. And you can see they've under uncovered another seam of coal underneath. Now, these strip mines can be incredibly huge. This is a picture taken of a West Virginia coal mine. Just to give you an idea of size, guys, if you take a look at this truck here in the foreground, I would come up, and I'm about 6'1", I would come up halfway to these tires. Okay, so I, my head would go somewhere here, let you know how large it is. This strip mine is probably a half mile to a, a three quarters of a mile deep. And you can't even see the other, other side of the mine. You might be talking about uh, a mile, maybe even a couple miles in diameter. These things can be incredibly huge. And once again, remember, we use strip mines. It's safer, it's cheaper. We can make more money because we can get more coal out of the ground. 
Now here's this underground technique. We use something called the pillar and shaft technique. What we do here, guys, is we remove one of these shafts. It would be these, these horizontal seams of coal. We then leave this next shaft, or these pillars, in place. That's holding up the thousands of feet of rock on top of it. You can actually see, here's the specialized equipment. I don't know what this is actually called. I call it the grinder. These things move at incredibly high speeds. You set it against the wall, it grinds up the coal. It then, um, you put it on a shuttle car. The shuttle car goes to some kind of conveyor belt, which is then lifted to the surface, um, usually in elevators or multiple elevators. But here's why you're lucky if you get 50% recovery. You have to leave the other half of coal in place, holding up all the rocks. Uh, here's a picture of, once again, I don't know what it's actually called. I just call it the grinder. These things uh, with the teeth move at incredibly high revolutions per minute. And so that's what grinds up the coal. You can see all the, the pieces of coal down here. It's then lifted to the surface through elevators. Now, generally for stability, guys, underground mines are at best maybe about five feet tall. You don't want to make them too high because then the stability is reduced. So generally you don't see many ex-NBA players uh, entering their second life as underground miners. Generally uh, shorter people tend to do better in this kind of confined claustrophobic uh, area. Now, let's talk about the environmental impacts of coal. And once again, we haven't talked about the burning portion. We'll get to that later, guys. So here's the important thing to remember. When it comes to fossil fuels, you get a double dose of environmental impacts. You get environmental impacts when you extract them and when you transport the fossil fuels. Then you have your environmental impacts when you burn it. That's why fossil fuels of all the energy sources, guys, have the most serious environmental consequences. Because all along the process, from extraction to transportation to burning it, you're going to produce environmental impacts. So let's look at the extraction and transportation first, just like we did with oil and natural gas. Um, coal mines, especially strip mines, we talk about a visual blight. When, when I say that, I'm talking about an eyesore. Let me go back for a second, guys. Is that pretty? Of course not. It's ugly. You have this blight upon the Earth's surface. That's, when we, that's what we mean when we say visual blight. These strip mines, especially if they're large enough, it's this eyesore. It's ugly, guys. Um, subsidence. Now, this is for underground mining. So, let's say that we had an underground mine that we didn't properly abandon and we start building houses on top of that area. All of that waste weight causes the underground mine to collapse. And so all of that soil is shifted five feet down. And so eventually what happens is the Earth's surface either gradually or suddenly sinks because the underground mine collapsed. That's what we call subsidence. It either happens gradually or it can happen overnight, very, very suddenly as well. Um, here's the biggest concern is all the amount of waste we produce. Think about it, guys. I mentioned that overburden, the rock that's on top of the coal that's waste. Let's say that we have 2,000, actually, let's say we have 1,000 feet uh, of waste on top of a coal, coal bed, and we decide to use a strip mine. Guess what that 1,000 feet of rock on top, the overburden is? It's waste, guys, and we have to dispose of it. Now, remember, the more waste we produce, the more potential we have for contamination issues. So coal mines, guys, there's always fairly high risk of both air, water, and soil contamination around those mines. Now, one specific type of contamination issue is something that we call AMD which stands for acid mine drainage. This is what happens, okay? Let's say we have a big pile of coal waste sitting at the Earth's surface, and it rains. That water gets into that coal waste, and it reacts with a specific mineral. I know we haven't talked about minerals yet. We will, guys. 
a specific mineral called pyrite. It's an iron sulfide mineral that is very, very commonly found in coal beds. Now, if you've ever heard of the name fool's gold, guys, that's what pyrite is. It looks like gold, but it's not. It's an iron sulfide mineral. So pyrite, very commonly found in coal beds. So the water reacts with this iron sulfide mineral, and as long as there's oxygen present, you create this acidic, heavy metal rich contaminated water. Okay, and in a lot of cases it's colorful. And when I say colorful, I mean you get like red or yellow or orange water. That's water that has con been contaminated with these specific type of, of heavy metals. So acid mine drainage, once again, fairly common, especially when we have all this coal waste that has the pyrite in it uh, on these um, mining sites. Now let me show you what some of these look like. And once again, let's start with this visual blight. This was actually the cover of a National Geographic back in the 90s. And just to give you an idea of, of scale, guys, from this side of the picture to this side of the picture is about a mile and a half. So you can see that these strip mines can be incredibly large. And notice the strip mine actually winds its way all the way around back here. Here's part of the strip mine back here, guys. That's not a natural ravine. That's part of the strip mine. And so you get this very ugly eyesore. Okay, I, I, you know, I like the term visual blight. It's ugly, guys. It's a scar on the surface of the earth. Uh, here's this subsidence. So let's take this, guys. We had an old underground mine that everybody forgot about, and it wasn't properly abandoned. And let's say the mining company went out of business. They went bankrupt. And so all the records were lost or destroyed or whatever. So 50 years after the, the original mine was active, developers come into this area and go, wow, this would be a great place for a subdivision. So they then start building houses, not knowing that there's an old mine underneath. Well, eventually, guys, the weight of all those houses and, and streets uh, and trees and everything causes the this underground mine to collapse and so all of this soil is shifted downward guys so either suddenly overnight or gradually everything sinks down and this cause very very um, this causes uh, engineering damage guys notice you have pictures here of buckled sidewalks you can see cracks in this house here, here's a crack in this apartment building going this and this way. So it's not just that all the soil is settling, it's then what the damage that causes to engineered structures, houses, apartment buildings that were built on top of that abandoned mine. And we've actually, this is a very common occurrence, guys, in Pennsylvania and Ohio and Indiana, where they had these coal mines back in the 30s and 40s. The company went broke, didn't abandon the mine because they didn't have any money, and everybody forgot there was a mine there, and then they went, went back and they developed the land, only to, to notice that 10 or 20 years later, they had all these engineering problems because of this subsidence. Uh, here's the waste issue. Um, this, these are the top 10 states that produce the most coal waste. Ohio, Indiana, and um, Iowa are tops on the list, guys. What this was, this was an EPA study done back in 2007 that looked at um, coal waste sites and what sites had water contamination issues. Everywhere you see a dot, guys, uh, is, a, is a coal waste site that produced uh, water contamination. And if you look at most of those dots, uh, come from the state where I come from, guys, Illinois. So we have a, a very serious problem, uh, especially down in southern Illinois, uh, with uh, old coal waste sites and the contamination that it, that it caused. Here is this AMD, guys. These are pictures of this um, acid mine drainage. So once again, you need pyrite, you need water and free oxygen. So you get a coal waste pile, it has the pyrite in it, it reacts, creating this very, very colorful, acidic, heavy metal rich water. Now the colors represent what heavy metals are in them. 
Yellow is cadmium, red is mercury. I'm not sure what orange is, guys. But once again, you can see these streams have been contaminated. So just picture Bambi's mom coming out of the trees, drinking the yellow water, and dying a horrible twitching death of heavy metal poisoning. Very, very serious problem, especially in these areas of um, these strip mines. All right, finally, let's get to the second part of our discussion, guys. So we've talked about the environmental impacts from the extraction and transportation of fossil fuels. Now let's talk about the burning of fossil fuels. And by the way, this is for all three, oil, natural gas, and coal. What are some of the environmental impacts we get when we burn them? Now, remember earlier, I said that from a chemical standpoint, whenever you burn something, you're essentially adding oxygen. That's what burning is, guys, from a chemical standpoint. So remember, fossil fuels are hydrocarbons. So they have carbon and hydrogen. When you add oxygen to that, guys, I hope um, you will realize that the, the most abundant gas that you're going to produce is CO2. is carbon dioxide gas, which is why, remember, it's the most abundant artificial greenhouse gas produced often when we burn fossil fuels. So we produce these greenhouse gases which get up into the atmosphere and lead to an enhanced greenhouse effect that we've already talked about in this class and then lead to global warming. Remember, you trap that excess heat in the atmosphere. You also, when you burn coal, guys, um, coal, for, coal often has a lot of nitrogen and sulfur in it. So when you burn it, you tend to produce sulfur dioxide gas and nitrous oxide gas. Remember I talked about this X, guys. That's not a misprint. Remember that X can stand for a 1, a 2, or a 3. So we can have NO, NO2, or NO3 gases. They get up into the atmosphere, they react with water, and they produce small droplets of sulfuric acid and nitric acid. These small droplets of acid fall to the earth and create what we call acid rain. The higher the concentrations of SO2 and NOx, guys, the higher the concentrations of the acid, the more powerful the effects of acid rain. A toxic metals. Remember, guys, what was Cole's nickname? Mother Nature's Junk Basket. It contains a lot of very, very toxic heavy metals. Cadmium, arsenic, lead, and mercury are just a few. Basically, if it's a heavy metal, I'm guessing coal has it. So when you burn it, you release small ash, small particles of these heavy metals, which then somebody walking in this particular area can be exposed to. And we've talked about heavy metals, guys. Remember, our bodies can't metabolize them, so they build up and build up and build up until they reach levels where we're talking about heavy metal poison. And then for coal again, guys, when we burn coal, not everything is going to be consumed through the burning process. So we have small particles called ash and bigger particles called cinders that we now have to dispose of. So now we've created more waste that we have to properly dispose of. Now let's take a look at some of these issues. And first, once again, CO2 emissions, guys. We talked about this, how China was number one. If you look at it, there's China's contribution. Here's our contribution, guys, U.S. This is the European Union, the 28 countries in the, in the EU. Then we have India, the other European, um, South America, Middle East, Asia, and Pacific, and then Africa. It's really, guys, notice how more than, I would say, more than half, maybe even like 60% of all the CO2 emissions comes from China, the U.S., and the European Union, the post-industrial world, guys. Now, remember, all that CO2 gets up, gets up into the atmosphere, and it creates this enhanced greenhouse effect, which means we trap that, that IR, that infrared radiation. We don't allow it to escape into space. We re-radiate it down, back down to the planet's surface, and it creates this overall increase in temperatures that we call global warming. Here's this acid rain phenomenon. So once again, guys, we have our SO2 and NOx gases. They react with water to produce H2SO4. That's sulfuric acid. 
and HNO3. That's nitric acid. These droplets then fall to the Earth's surface, can create disruptions uh, in our biomes, can create problems with uh, biological organisms, even if they're high enough, guys, can dissolve slowly materials like concrete or asphalt over decades or even longer. Now, what can we do? We need to minimize. We can't eliminate, guys. That's impossible. But how can we minimize the environmental impacts of fossil fuels? The biggest thing that we can do is this process called reclamation. We're actually going to see this again, guys, when we get to minerals. And that's why it's um, underlined, guys. That's a very important vocabulary word. Reclamation is essentially restoring the area that we mine the coal from and trying to convert it back to its natural condition. That's what reclamation means. You're restoring it back to pre-mining um, levels. And so often what you'll do, let's say that we have a strip mine, guys. We would refill the strip mine. We'd put all the waste rock back in. We would recontour the land surface to make it match what it once did. And we would replant native vegetation and treat any waste material that was on site. The whole purpose is to restore back to its natural condition. So strip mines, guys, even underground mines, we need to reclaim them. We can divert water away from waste piles. Remember, we want to prevent AMD. Remember what that stands for, guys. Acid mine drainage. The colorful, acidic, heavy metal rich water. We don't want water getting in the waste piles because we know there's pyrite in there. We can take the ash and the cinders, the things that won't be burned, and we can put them back into our underground mines when mining operations have ceased. We dump all of that waste rock back in, guys. That reduces the chance of subsidence later on. And then here's the most important part, guys, is when we burn fossil fuels, particularly coal, we use something called air scrubbers. Air scrubber is a generic term for any device that is used to remove some of the very, very fine particulate matter and some of the greenhouse gases before the exhaust goes up our stack into the atmosphere. Remember guys, if we own a coal-fired power plant, the EPA has told us how many units of air pollution we can produce in a year. If we go over, remember we, we get fined, we lose money. And so often our coal-fired power plants will have multiple air scrubbers that will remove the very, very fine solid matter and some of the greenhouse gases so that we can get under those levels set by the EPA. Now, I wanted to share with you a couple of these reclamation projects, guys, to show you what they look like. So think of these as um, plastic surgery photos, the before and after pictures. So on the left there, you have a, a fairly small um, coal mining site in, 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 in Indiana. You can actually see the piles of waste off to the left there, guys. Those black piles, that's not like um, nutrient-rich soil. That's waste. They went in, they reclaimed that old mine, and the picture on the right is what it looks like today. They actually converted it into a municipal park. Now, in order to do this, guys, you would want to make sure that you had zero lingering traces of contamination because we know kids put things in their mouth that they shouldn't. And so if you want to turn a coal mine into a park used by kids, you would want to make sure no traces of contamination were left over. But, but think about it, guys. Once again, remember the purpose of reclamation, to restore the land to its pre-mining conditions, to restore it to its natural condition. Did it fairly well in this one. Um, this other one is perhaps the most... Um, probably the largest reclamation project that I've ever come across. Once again, uh, the before picture on, is on the left, guys. This was a uh, fairly large mine in western Kentucky, what it looked like in February of 98. And I want you to look at the water. Look at the color of the water. We know we have AMD, don't we, guys? The, the water is kind of a reddish-brown. We know we have heavy metal contamination there. 
they went in, it took them about a year and a half, and about, uh, I think about $2 billion was the cost of this. Reclamation projects, especially if you have contamination, can be very, very costly, guys. But they went in, they reclaimed it. Notice the picture on the right is what it looks like today. Answer me this, guys. If you look at that after picture, could you tell that there was a strip mine there to begin with? No. That's the purpose of reclamation, guys. Restore the land to its natural condition. Now, there's a couple last things that we want to talk about when talking about fossil fuels. And these are what are called alternative fossil fuels. Okay, They're not your conventional oil or natural gas or coal. And there's two types. We have oil shales and tar sands. Now, let's talk about oil shales first. What a shale is, guys, it's a specific type of sedimentary rock often deposited in oceanic environments. So you'll get shale deposition in oceans. So fairly common because we know oceans cover 70% of the Earth's surface. What an oil shale is, is a shale that has high levels of something called kerogen. What kerogen is, it's a mixture of hydrocarbons from which we can extract liquid hydrocarbons. Now, essentially, guys, we take this solid rock, we grind it, and we process it to create a petroleum-like substitute. It's not true petroleum, guys. It's not true oil. It's a stand-in, a substitute for true petroleum. Now, we also have tar sands. A tar sand is where we have deposits of sand that contain a very dense and viscous form of petroleum called bitumen. Okay, so think of tar sands. Think of tarry sands. Sands that are covered with very, very, very viscous type of um, tar. Now, for those of you that do not know, viscosity is the resistance of a fluid to flow, flow at normal temperatures. So if you have a high viscosity, you don't want to flow. Think of some common things that have a high viscosity that we use on an everyday basis, guys. Syrup, molasses, honey, all very, very viscous forms. So the problem with tar sands is you can't drill a well into the sands and extract the, the petroleum because it, it's viscous. It, it clings to the sand grains. And so what you have to do is you have to process both the sand and the bitumen, separate them. Now here's the big thing with all these alternative fossil fuels, guys. Both kerogen and bitumen require more processing than crude oil. So we add another step, a processing step to take the kerogen and the bitumen and convert them into these petroleum-like substitutes. Well, that extra processing step, guys, increases the cost and increases the environmental impact because we're going to produce more waste, have the potential for more pollution concerns. So generally, alternative fossil fuels are only used when the price of oil is high because that extra processing step is going to increase our cost, guys. So when the price of oil is low, generally the oil shale and tar sand industries uh, reduce production or maybe shut down for a while because it doesn't make economic sense. Once again, guys, when it comes to energy, and we're also going to see when it comes to minerals, our first concern is always profit. It's always economics. What is it going to cost us to extract and process it? And what can we sell it for on the open market? If we're going to lose money, guys, we just can't do it. And so once again, these alternative fossil fuels are only going to be used when the price of oil is fairly high. Now, here's our oil shale. And if you're curious what it looks like, guys, so here's this oil shale. And once again, you can see the color represents that high organic content. That's that kerogen that's in there, guys. Now, the good news is we have fairly large oil shale deposits in the U.S. In Wyoming, 
Colorado and into Utah. You can see this picture uh, down here, guys. Major deposits in Utah, into Colorado, and fairly large ones in Wyoming as well. Uh, the 2013 world estimate for oil shale was set at about 345 billion barrels. From 42 countries, Russia had the most at about 75 billion barrels, but we weren't that far behind with about 58. Now, I know a lot of kids see that 345 billion barrels and think, wow, our crisis is solved. Is it, guys? Remember, in 2018, the U.S. alone used 7.5 billion barrels that year. So is 345 billion barrels really going to last us that long? No. Maybe another decade, guys. <laughs> the problem is, is we know we've actually estimated the reserves. And if you look at oil, guys, uh, the latest estimates that I've seen is we have about uh, 40 years left of, of oil reserves left. Think about that, guys. That's within your lifetime. I'll be dead. That, uh, 80, that'll put me at 87, guys. I'm not going to be alive for that. But that's within your lifetime that we are pre predicted to run out of oil. Kind of scary, guys. Um, here's these tar sands. And I wanted to point out Canada because Canada actually has large deposits of these tar sands. Uh, you can also call them oil sands. I call them tar sands, guys. Same thing. But once again, notice it just looks like tarry sand. That's exactly what it is. But you can't drill a well and pump out the, the bitumen. It doesn't want to flow. So you have to extract both. You separate the sand grains, usually with using steam. The sand is then waste. And then you have that bitumen, which you can then process. Remember the extra processing step, guys, to get that petroleum-like uh, substitute. But once again, uh, oil, shales, and tar sands are not going to be widely used when the price of oil is low. It doesn't make economic sense. And remember, our first consideration when it comes to energy resources, or, or in our case, energy reserves, is what's it going to cost us? What can we extract it, and what can we sell it for? Uh, this is the end of our fossil fuel discussion, guys. Um, the second half of this, we'll look at nuclear and our renewable energy sources.